I want to say hello to Mr. Jonathan Mauner. Thank you for uh, taking the time to be with us this evening, and glad you can join us. Um, Thanks, Jim. Glad to be glad to be here. Sorry, I'm a little late dialing in. I had a call that ran over. That that's quite all right. Um, what what you see, and you've you've been involved with uh, uh, Zoom and uh, WebEx before. Um, we had a, a a class discussion, a general discussion about uh, um, about general topics. Uh, talked about current events. Talked about what was going on with the NFL, Drew Brees, um, everything else. Roger Goodell's statement, what have you. And I gave them uh, gave the class like five minutes uh, break here. Uh, told them to be back uh, at 7:30. We're at 7:31. We see a lot of white screens. So if our <laughs> friends, uh, if everyone's back. Uh, we can turn on our video um, or uh, un unmute our video so everybody can see each other. Uh, and then we'll give maybe another minute. Uh, here we have more people coming coming back into the fray here. Um, we'll, another minute and then we'll uh, we'll start off with uh, uh, Jonathan's chat. Uh, uh, this is probably like the fifth year or sixth year that you've been doing this for us, I believe. Um, you started actually with our finance person, David Abrams. Yeah. Uh, and then when he left, we we grabbed you, we robbed you, and brought you over here to our uh, managing the sport enterprise, our our introductory course. So um, uh, we have more people coming on. Um, we, there was some connection issues with some other folks. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to have Jonathan uh, speak to us. Uh, uh, he's he's always been very interesting. Uh, he might have some slides as well to talk about, and then. Uh, at the end uh, of his uh, speech, Jonathan uh, will be more than happy to answer some questions, which I know uh, I will have. Again, and just a brief overview again, uh, Jonathan, uh, interim head of Fox Sports, uh, former uh, CFO of the Miami Dolphins of Hard Rock Stadium, Florida Panthers, and Major League Baseball. And that's just part of it. So I'll let him uh, uh, take it over. Uh, uh, one of the good things that people like is when I shut up, and I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> Thanks, Jim, and and hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, good to have a chance to speak with you. Uh, sorry, we can't all be together. It's always easy to do these things when you're standing in a room. You can kind of read the room a lot easier than than having to do it this way. I, I mentioned it, Jim, uh, in in, the, in agreeing to do this. I would uh, try and keep my actual comments fairly short, partly because you guys have been on screens for such a long time and it's not the best medium for doing it. I don't think I've perfected making myself sound any, any more interesting you know, on a, on a format like this. And so uh, I'll, I'll try and just give some general observations about what's going on in the sports world. Uh, I normally talk about the business of sports. I, I've got just a couple of slides I'll share with you just to kind of set up, you know, what I think is probably the more uh, the more uh, interesting and more relevant topic today, which is you know we've got all these different sports leagues that are that are essentially not uh, 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 you know playing right now. And the question is you know you know what what you know could be done to to change that. And and I thought I could at least share some of my insights, having been essentially an insider about what I think you know can and perhaps you know, should happen. Um, I'm going to open up this, just to show you just a couple of, able to get this working with Jim on a test run a couple days ago. Um, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the button right next to your camera, the, the share content, John. Yep, I think it's, it's loading now. There we go. There we go. All right, good. So... <clears throat> You know, when I've done this before, as I mentioned, I talk about the, you know, I, I try and, and just give some perspective on the business of sports, and especially since I spent, you know, 20 plus years in, in baseball, you know, some perspective on, on, on that. Uh, one of the slides that I've, that I've uh, used before is this one. In fact, it's kind of a two-parter, um, and I'll use this as kind of a jumping off part to talk about what's happening today, and I've got one other slide just three slides I'll share with you. This one is one that I put together probably, uh, as you can see from the timeline, two, uh, it was about 2003, 2004 time frame. And I was looking at baseball. I won't, I won't you know, read this to you, but I was looking at how the business model for baseball in particular 
and I think in many sports changed over over time. Uh, that first column on the left, you know, I the pre seventy five column you know, talks about baseball when really all the power was with the owners. Uh, there was no free agency. Uh, baseball was you know up to that point probably the top sport you know from a, from a fan and media perspective and the economics kind of flowed from that. And those next two columns just talks about how over time um, you know things shifted. Um, you know, you've got you know, the other sports, the NFL, NBA, especially in the 80s and, 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 and 90s kind of took off. And it really you know, put a lot of pressure on baseball to change its model. The distribution channels, the proliferation of cable, and ultimately, you know, after, you know, uh, over the last 10 years, you know, you know, the digital divide, streaming, all kind of changed how people basically, you know, in, enjoyed the sport. Uh, how they how they kind of engaged in it and and, and it, it affected the economics as well. As, as, in addition to it, it addressed how you know who your market was, how you address the market, et cetera, and the and the business model kind of followed from that. I did a, a, an update to this uh, where I added this fourth column. Um, you know, uh, and I the 2014 to the present. Um, you guys, I'm not sure if I can make this any bigger. Hopefully, you guys can, can read that. Your, your eyes are younger than mine. But in the 2002 to 2014, the present, the present, when I did this, was probably through 2017, 2018. I put this on here not so much to focus on it as much as to talk about how if I were updating, if I were you know, speaking today on the business, I would probably start adding a fifth column. Uh, I think that where we are with COVID uh, is going to force the industry to change the model once again. You know, most of these business models were driven off of you know, fans in the stands trying to drive uh, eyeballs, you know, on traditional TV. Um, given the generational shifts, given the fact that probably for the next two years, easily this year, next year, and perhaps even beyond that, uh, the idea of trying to pack a stadium uh, and, 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 and to really generate revenue from, from, from that model is going to change. How people uh, really entertain uh how, how they're entertained by sports is going to change. Uh, uh, I actually had a very interesting call this afternoon, just kind of out of the blue. There's a uh, uh, one of the big architectural firms, sports architectural firms, is called HKS. Uh, they, uh, amongst the buildings that they designed, uh, is the uh, Cowboy Stadium, that's a fairly, fairly iconic, uh, you know, NFL stadium. They design or, or finished the design for the LA Stadium, SoFi Stadium in, in LA. Uh, they did the Rangers old stadium, and, uh, and the Rangers had there not been a uh, shutdown of the game, would have opened up their new stadium that HKS designed, and they've done some other buildings uh, across the, the sports landscape. But the guy that called me, one of the partners, is Brian Truby, and his idea was, and it's still kind of in the form of stage. But the whole th and, and HKS is a, as an architectural firm, is a firm that doesn't just design buildings; they look at at the business of, of the building. How do you generate more revenue? How do you really, how do people really engage in the sport within the building? They think even beyond that. And the comment that he wanted to share with me today was how, uh, because they have, as a, as, a, as a design firm, because they've got uh, a digital representation of the facility, they've got this idea to perhaps create a viewing experience where, and if you've ever, I'm not sure if you've ever seen an architectural firm do a presentation. Uh, but uh, today, unlike you know years ago when you would simply see these flat two-dimensional renderings of a building, today the technology is such that you can literally walk through a building digitally. They can literally show you you know much at a, at a way far more enhanced than even some of the best video games. It can literally show you that facility where you can literally walk through the building as if it's actually built and it's simply a 3D rendering given a lot of the CAD technology. And his idea was, what if you took that technology and you allowed fans sitting at home to literally be in that stadium? And what if you took that same three-dimensional, you know, essentially, you know, in, in some respects, I guess you would call it, you know, augmented reality. You're going to put you into that space. Uh, but what if you could actually superimpose the game? What if you actually had a simultaneous broadcast of the game uh, in that stadium so that you, you're watching a, a live presentation and you're actually, um, you know, sitting in the stands, if you will, 
and and if the and what if the if the visual representation if you think about our zoom screens what if what if you either had you know avatars or as i suggested what if you actually had people who were watching a game on a zoom screen you know if if the stadium if every stadium seat had a a, a, a picture of a zoom screen of a person sitting there now there's an awful lot of technology, a lot of bandwidth, a lot of really matching up of, of streaming with, with this digital technology that, that it takes place. But but the, the whole point is that fifth column, if you think about the business model, rather than you know, as a as an operating uh, entity, the stadium thinking that they've got to find a way to attract anywhere from twenty to forty thousand people, in the case of baseball or, or eighty thousand or so in football, to physically be there, especially in this environment. What if you could watch at home? What does that really mean for what your capacity is? You're now talking, in fact, I, I, you know, there's a stat that people mention. I'm not sure that I've ever fact-checked it. But you know, the NFL being you know, presumptively one of the most popular sports in America, uh, the, the, the stat that you hear is that only about 1% of NFL fans have ever watched a live game. So when it comes to generating your revenue as a business model, on in-stadium activity, uh, you can only put in, if you're, if you're Jerry Jones, he's got probably the largest NFL stadium, but he can only hold 100,000 people. What if Jerry Jones could charge you to watch this virtual game, your Zoom-like game from your living room, for an additional fee? Now, granted, you can watch it today on Fox on Sunday for nothing. But what if Jerry Jones charged you an extra 10 bucks or $20 a game to be in the stadium? And that the visual depiction of you sit, you're sitting in the stands, especially today when you can't physically be there potentially. Maybe I think Texas only allow will only allow 50% capacity. What if he, he charged you extra to to actually be virtually at the game? Would you pay for that? Um, and what are the advertising and, and sponsorship opportunities to present the game in that way? And so that fifth column, uh, which is why I wanted to share this particular model, that fifth column would have a whole different business model. I'm not quite sure. What it looks like, I think we're on the on the on the verge of it changing, but it'll be a very very different picture. The last slide I'll show you, and then I'll just give you some broad observations off of this, um, is this slide. This is a very old slide. You can see it's 2002, and the numbers have changed uh, in in some respects. I did this slide. I I just joined Major League Baseball. I I had a chance to talk to my uh, counterparts at the NHL, NBA, and NFL and to get their numbers. And this is a, really, it's a two-page slide. This is the revenue depiction. I'll come back to this. And this second slide shows, this is a, you know, in the financial world, it's called a common size income state. Basically, revenues at 100%, and this is the expenses as a percentage of revenue. Now, again, these numbers have shifted. There's been at least three separate collective bargain agreements amongst the leagues. The, NL, the, NBA, the NBA and NHL have since gone to a revenue sharing model where the player salary number is probably closer to 50% now than it is these numbers. The reason they shifted is because they were losing money. But what I wanted to show you, again, the expense side isn't as much important as on the revenue side. This number hasn't changed that much. In, in, in talking about the impact of what's happening today, um, uh, this slide, I thought, again, it's an old slide. I haven't really up I updated it about maybe five, six years ago, but I can't find it. But I thought this gives you, on a relative basis, a, a good depiction of, you know, kind of where the money comes from when it comes to sports teams across the leagues. The, the biggest num uh, advantage, the biggest number that, that, that I want to focus on is that top line. And I, it says gate receipts. Um, if you go down to other revenue, you see state related revenue. If you add those two numbers together, that's what's at stake. That gate receipts number, the other state of revenue number, that's what's at stake when you can't bring people to the stadium. Now, in the case of baseball, I can tell you that number, it says 44 plus 18. That number is probably, you know, if that adds up to, you know, 62, it's probably closer to 45 now, with the difference really being local TV. The local TV numbers have grown dramatically since 02. That local number is probably close to 25. Uh, 30% now. Um, but I, I, when I, I was trying to just come up with a kind of a, a relative depiction of, of what the fight is all about with baseball, and this is really what it is. Um, the, 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 uh, the expense number, uh, the one that really matters most is that uh, baseball uh, players' salaries are roughly 50% of revenue. 
So if you think about the gate receipts number, you think about the other stadium-related revenue, which is, it's, in, it's in 18. Again, given the growth of local TV and even national TV money, that number, those two numbers together probably closer to 50%, the, the, the broadcast revenue. Uh, and the gate receipts and the state of the is probably closer today, closer to, to 40% on average, you know, 35 to 40, depending upon the state, the, 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 the team. Uh, if you think about it, just from pure math perspective, if half your revenue, if half your revenue goes towards expenses, the player expenses, and you're going to lose 40% of your revenue, it, it really makes things really tight. So when you think about the debate that's taking place today between the players and the, and, and the owners in baseball, the players are saying we'll take a pro rata reduction in our in, in our salaries if we only play you know the regular seasons 162 games. So if you play 81 games, I'll take half my salary. The problem is that's still 50 percent of revenue. If you had all your revenue, if you're playing in front of state in, in front of fans, if you're not playing in front of fans, you lose 40 percent of your revenue. So, so that, really, that's what the debate's all about. Uh, you know, the question is, how do you get there? Uh, and, uh, and a bigger question that I've raised, I'm working with some students at Columbia University on a, on a, on a kind of a summer project, uh, kind of an exercise for them. The real question is, if you were able to actually get the games on the field, and this is true, going to be true for the NBA as well as the NHL, how do you really present the games? You know, if, if there, there was, an, a, there was a, an example of, of playing in front of an empty stadium um, in baseball, uh, about three years ago, uh, if you, you know, in, in, in the context of what's happening today in terms of social unrest, Freddie Gray was the African-American who was being transported by the Baltimore City Police to jail, uh, apparently unchained or un, 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 untethered uh, uh, in the back of a van, ended up dying. And as a result of that, um, and I believe the pol police officers were acquitted, uh, and Baltimore had, you know, riots of a scale then that you're seeing today. But it was all, at that point was restricted strictly to Baltimore. And it had happened during the summer. And baseball had to basically cancel. Uh, the Orioles had uh, had a homestand right around the time this was happening. And baseball had to, had to essentially cancel um, two of the three Orioles homestands uh, games. And as a result, they, they, they realized, given this, the impact on the standings, they couldn't uh, reschedule all three games. The Orioles were not in contention. If the Orioles fan, you could you probably get that right away. So they didn't have to play them per se, but they wanted to at least get uh, enough of them in to, to not influence the standing. So they ended up playing uh, one game um, in the afternoon in an empty stadium. So it's happened already. And I was talking to one of my colleagues uh, uh, from MLB who uh, – who had a, a particular memory about the game, uh, Gary Thorne, uh, who was a, uh, 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 an announcer for the Oreos, had to call the game. And my, my colleague told me that Gary Thorne, in calling this game, again, there, were no, there were no fans in the stands at all for this Oreos game. I think they may have been playing the Yankees or the Red Sox. It was a division uh, opponent. And Gary Thorne is reported to have said, as he was calling the game, sitting in the press box, uh, he was so conscious of his voice being echoed throughout the entire building that he actually uh, apparently said, I have to use my golf voice and kind of talk in a whisper so as not to disturb what's happening on the field. You know, the point being, when you think about you know, the challenge of an NBA will, will have a somewhat similar challenge. You'll, you'll hear sneakers squeaking more than you hear voices. In the case of the NHL, you'll hear a lot of, you know, ice scraping uh, and puck slapping. You know, the question really is, you know, what does that look like and to what extent is that a product that people will want to con con consume on, a, on an ongoing basis? I think when any of these sports start, the curiosity factor, the, bore the boredom factor will make the viewership very high. And it may sustain itself throughout the course of, 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 of their seasons and, and the postseason, just given the fact there's not an awful lot else going on. But it really raises the question of, you know, in, in looking at the economics um, and what's at stake, you know, first of all, is it worth it to, to, to do that? In the case of the NHL and, and, and the NBA, they've substantially finished their season. They only have a handful of games to go to finish the season. 
uh, and apparently they're going to essentially go into a playoff format for the first, for the most part, anyway. But for baseball, it's like, what's you know, do you really want to do it, and what impact will it have on the game? Will you have you know, or conversely, is it an opportunity to do something different? Now, the technology that I described for that HKS is talking about. But also, you know, what, how would you present the game? Uh, you know, what would you do differently? You know, how do you, if, if in the case of baseball, you're trying to attract a younger audience, does it make sense to mic the players? I actually sent a note to, I know Tony Clark, the head of the Players Association. I sent him a note a few weeks ago, and I don't think it was an original thought, but I said, you know, you guys ought to seriously consider uh, allowing your players to be mic And I sent it to Tony because I know that, you know, the players are very sensitive to being mic'd. They're sensitive for a number of reasons. Number one, you know, you can't swear the way you want to swear. <laughs> and clearly, you know, on a lot of, you know, uh, there's not a lot of church language taking place in a dugout on the field. Uh, also, uh, you know, baseball players are very superstitious. You know, mic on a game, and this has happened before, because occasionally, you, you know, especially during the postseason, you might mic a player and, and, and pull a commentary from them. But if a player is mic and, and doesn't get a hit, he'll think it was because of the microphone, which, of course, has nothing to do with it. But that's a factor. Uh, and, the, and the third thing is uh, strategically, you know, how much do you really want to disclose in the course of a game? My proposal to Tony was, you know, this might be an opportunity since you're not going to have a full season anyway. Since you're only going to have, you know, maybe 50 games, as many as 80 games. I don't think they'll have more than 75 games when I'm reading. I don't have any inside information. But if, if that's the case, um, um, then, and, and if so, if the stats and if the, in the game presentation is going to be different anyway, you know, going back to the Gary Thorne uh, observation that, you know, totally quiet stadium is not the greatest place to, to watch a game. What if you decided, my proposal was, what if you decided to, to mic all the players? And what if the present, uh, let's say it's a second feed. And what if the presentation wasn't, you know, if you think about the, the traditional baseball game where you've got two, you know, old guys, you know, it's the old guys, you know, relatively speaking, two guys, 40s, 50s, just kind of talking, having this conversation about what's happening, describing what they're seeing and having a conversation about, you know, this reminds me of the time and, you know, uh, but the action and a lot of the crowd noise reacting to what's happening in the field really creates a lot of the environment for the broadcast. If you don't have that, you just got two guys talking. What if you instead uh, had a, an alternate broadcast? And what if you brought in, you know, some uh, millennial type, something, something like you guys who's a huge fan, but just wants to talk about what's happening on the field between the players? And what if you're getting feeds? You know, the guy, the guy gets a hit, and runs the first base, uh, and he's talking to either his first base coach, he's talking to the, to, to, or he's talking to the first baseman about the pitch he saw. Or, you know, it could be any number of conversations. But the proposition to consider is, you know, is that what the product might be that might drive more interest in the game than simply talking about the intermittent action that might take place? You know, if a batter takes, you know, six or eight pitchers, that's an awful lot of dead time, an awful lot of, you know, quiet conversation in, in, the, in the press box. As opposed to what if the commentation, commentary was, you know, you're picking up literally sound bites between, you know, the catcher uh, and the batter, the, you know, the batter and the umpire, because they have conversations, too, that you never hear about. But, and, and I, you know, the, and the, the, the thinking is the NFL does this, has been doing it for decades. Into the season, NFL films will have their own little reel that shows sideline conversations, you know, coaches talking to a guy coming off the field, you know. Those are things that really capture our imagination, capture our interest. And so that was one of the ideas that I, again, wasn't an original idea, but one that I thought, you know, as you think about changing the game, the economics changing, could you drive more consistent viewership and perhaps even attract new eyeballs if the game you were presenting was a very, very different product than what you're currently used to seeing? So just an observation. Um, the, um, and so that was really all I wanted to talk about in terms of my formal remarks. You know, I, I, I'd like to, you know, open it up questions. You know, obviously they're questions about uh, what's been happening the last week or so that I've, I've got my own thoughts on. But let me just pause for a second. And, and if you've got questions about, you know, either the, 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 the slides I've shown, the, the, the thoughts about the future of the game, the, the, you know, the, 
the, you know, the way that the leagues are approaching this very, very unusual season. Let me just pause and, and just see if you've got any questions. John, that, have have. John, that, that that would have to be a real, um, you know, to to pay a ten or twenty dollars extra um, and still sit and watch in your home and to convince the people that it's a lot more attractive and a lot more different and uh, more upswing than the regular Fox broadcast or ESPN Monday Night Football, because um, they're probably want to going to want to do the same thing. Um, I don't know. Is it? I'm just, I'm just trying to think what would need to be done to make it worth the twenty or dollars or the ten dollars that would that would go forward. Well, one of the ideas again, this is you know, if referring to the idea that HTS has put forward. One of the ideas would be you would actually have a chance, and there's some some technology that's that's you know parts of this that already exists. But one idea would be you could actually choose your camera angles. You can choose you know where you're going to watch the game. If you think about it today, you go to a game and you, you buy a ticket and you've got to sit behind home plate or you sit in left field or in the outfield. What if you could actually change your seat? What if you can actually, I want to, I want to see the, I want to see the pitches. You know, this is a, you know, Justin Verlander's pitching. I want to actually sit behind home plate and, and see him pitch as opposed to, uh, you know, what's it like sitting in the green monster, which I've done. And it's a great seat, a different view. So that would be part of it. Uh, you know, having a because you know, unlike in a physical ballpark, you're not restricted into how many times you can sell the same seat, or sell the same view. So presumably, there'd be some value to that. Gotcha, Miss Mary. Uh, sorry, Miss Mary, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I. That's the first time I've ever even heard that as like a possibility. Um, I, I think it's a very intriguing idea. I might buy into it and buy it to just to, you know, get a different camera angle. Um, but uh, is there any, uh, did it, has anyone looked into, um, or is there, are there any numbers as far as like how much it's going to cost teams to set up that technology? I know it's just a um, yeah, it's, it's a great question, and, and and what we talked about in the call today again, this is all preliminary conversations. The technology is still evolving. Um, when you think about the you know the, the more important elements of the cost, though, the broadcast is already being uh, generated, and she's simply taking an existing fee. So there's no extra cost per se in that. You know, one of the things they think might be a challenge will be just the bandwidth. You know, how much bandwidth will it take, uh, either in the home or in terms of, you know, distributing it that many more times. Uh, I'm not a technologist, but that seemed to be a more of a, of, of a challenge than, than the actual cost per se of, 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 of doing it. Uh, there's really no incremental cost at all. And, and when, when you think about, um, uh, you know, a traditional, you know, stadium setup um, or the, 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 the traditional way that teams sell tickets, and this is something that when I was CFO at the league, I, I you know, made comments to owners about this based on, uh, you know, some, you know, talking to some professors like, you know, uh, uh, Michael Porter, one of the strategy professors at, at, at HBS. One of, his, one of his big themes is that selling season tickets is not a great economic uh, option for teams because you take your best inventory, you know, let's say between the bases, between first and third base, you know, 20 rows up, take your best inventory and you fix the price and you sell it out by January, uh, and then the Yankees come to town, and the secondary ticket mark, the secondary market is going to sell the ticket you just got two hundred bucks for for two thousand um, dollars. Conversely, uh, today especially, it's very hard to sell someone one hundred eighty-one games. If you're, if you, no matter how big a Marlins or Mets or Yankees fan you are, Red Sox fan, even if you had a season ticket for eighty-one games, you can't go that many times. Uh, you just physically can't go unless you're a total fanatic, and there are very, very, really people that are that fanatical. And so the idea, you know, to the first point, if you could sell the same ticket, uh, or I'll, I'll state it differently, there are people who will buy a season ticket package uh, for the Cubs, and let's say the Yankees are coming to town that season in Italy play, you can buy your, your Cubs season tickets, uh, sell out the Yankee homestand. You can sell out the White Sox homestand. You know, pick two or three of the big competitors, uh, 
you know, sell those, you know, you can basically sell those on the secondary market and pay for your entire package and not go to any games that you just go to like a handful of games anyway. So the point being selling, you know, you know, we talk, I, I throw out the number 20 bucks. You could potentially, uh, you know, upsell uh, for more than that. It could be less than that. But the, 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 the key quantitative thing that people think about is that you're going to only spend X amount of dollars per year for tickets. You won't buy a season ticket package for $10,000, but you might spend 5000 to go to three Yankee games. Um, and so the economics can actually work out to, to your favor. You can sell to a lot more people. And as I said before, you can sell the same seat in, in this digital world than trying to sell that one seat, you know, three rows back behind home plate that you can only sell one time uh, in a season ticket package. So that's kind of, again, that's just, you know, this is a new idea, but the economics, and I've thought about this a lot, the economics can be quite advantageous in terms of, you know, selling a lot more to a lot more people at a lot smaller price, especially since season, again, season tickets are, they're, 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 they are a dinosaur. Clubs love them because if it's raining or if, if, if you know, if a, a bad team's coming to town, you still got the money. Uh, but that game's only going to last so long. It's a Thank thing you. That, that we were talking about, and it's a big thing now, and I guess the Oakland A's started it last year or two years ago, where people don't want to sit in the same seat anymore. They, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't want to be there. Like you said, they want to walk around, and thanks a lot, COVID-19, for, you know, that. I mean, they went ahead, and even in their old, I don't want to say dump, because I actually like the ballpark at Oakland. <laughs> I've, I've been there. Um, it's a You know? Um, <laughs> I, I like it, especially on a sunny day. It's nice and sunny. The, uh, you know, they s screwed it up a little bit when they built Mount Davis for, you know, Al Davis. Um, but, you know, what they did, right, and you know about this, and we were telling uh, the students, is that they've built out areas, they've ripped out seats, and they've created premium areas, bars, where instead mm -hmm. of seats, there's more drink rails where people can come and they can purchase a, a season ticket, but they don't have to sit in the same seat. They can sit in they can stand in left field in the upper deck and network with their people or they can maybe go and purchase um that one game they can go and sit in center field and there's there's yep. bars there so as opposed to additional seat uh specific seats there's now just where areas where they can network and hang out and stand and be like at a bar um and and have have it that way um and then they get discounts on concessions you know, or they could, God knows what that's going to look like, and parking and everything else and promotions, God knows what that's going to look like. But um, that that would have been the thing of the future, I guess, but now that's all gone away. Well, you know, to your point, Jim, uh, there are th at least three new ticketing innovations that came about. I started my sports career with the Marlins uh, uh, here in South Florida, and, uh, you know, since that time, the three new innovations that have come out uh, is one, as you've mentioned, Cleveland. I was in Cleveland last September uh, visiting some friends there, and they have a very similar feature where they took, if you think about, you know, you know, staring out towards the right field foul pole. Uh, they took, you know, from, you know, the foul pole going out towards center field, they took uh, maybe 20 rows up. They took all the seats out from the 20 rows up to out to the concourse, put in this huge... Budweiser Sports Bar, sponsored, of course, uh, and put in uh, 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 you know, rails, uh, uh, drink tops. So uh, you can basically buy a, a ticket to simply, it's kind of an SRO, you know, ticket, but you can basically, you know, hang out at the bar, you know, walk down to one of the rails and just kind of lean over, and they've got like four or five rolls of that. And my friend who invited me, uh, he's about my age, he has a, uh, he says he has a, a daughter and a, and a niece that are in their early 20s. He said uh, they love now going to the games when before he had had to drag them to go with them to a game. He's a huge Indians fan, but they love going there because they get to hang out. But that's one innovation that's, that, 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 is, that more teams are doing. The second uh, is, uh, as you've also described, it's, it's basically giving, I know the Mets have done this as well, it's basically buying something like a season pass or, or, or a month pass where for X amount, you know, 30, 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month, you can go to X number of games and pretty much sit in a designated section, but not a designated seat. Um, 
and that's very new. Uh, and the third thing that really this did start about 10 years ago, it's called the loaded ticket and it addresses the point you kind of inferred in terms of the cost of concessions. Um, I think the Phillies one of the first teams that did this, but the loaded ticket is, you know, for a, you know, and it's typically, you know, seating that's, you know, outside the foul pole or it's typically the second or third deck up, but for, you know, a, a $20 ticket, uh, it also includes a hot dog and a Coke. Uh, they'll still make their beer money, <laughs> which is where the margins really are. Um, but the loaded ticket is one way that, that they, again, you get people to show up for one fixed price, you, you get a $20 ticket, you get a chance to, to go and get a hot dog and a Coke. They get a, there's a, uh, and, and in the digital age, it's usually a digital component where you can actually, you know, just scan your ticket and the, and the, and the, the value is on it. Uh, some teams would simply put a dollar value on it. You can, you know, it's it's a it's a twenty dollar ticket and it's a ten dollars worth of value that you can use for whatever you want at the concession stand. But that those are three innovations that were designed to address what you just discussed. Would you add uh, dynamic pricing into that conversation as well, used by the that Cardinals is, and the Yankees? I think. Yep, dynamic pricing. Uh, was was a great innovation. The Giants were one of the first teams that started dynamic pricing back, I want to say, 10 plus years ago. Uh, uh, and it was, I mentioned earlier, the notion of a season ticket not being, you know, a great value because you fix the price of your product, uh, you know, usually during the off season before the season ever starts, not knowing how valuable that ticket really is. Dynamic pricing clearly addresses that. It allows you to basically move the price based on supply and demand in both directions. Uh, again, that's, I, I want to say 2010 was about when, as I recall, the Giants brought in a company, uh, this young, a couple of PhDs had this algorithm that simply looked at the pricing of tickets in the secondary market. And they moved the price of the unsold inventory, the, you know, the, the, the primary ticket price based on what they were seeing in the secondary market and, and, and or based on the opponent, you know, sometimes you keep the price up knowing that there will be some last minute demand, but absolutely, it was a, a great innovation for the, for the uh, those teams, and it was really a, a step beyond what started probably 15 plus years ago, variable pricing. Variable pricing was when you would simply set tiers. You look at the schedule, and if you're the Marlins, uh, and the Yankees are coming to town, and the Cubs are coming to town, the Dodgers, you'll set it. You'll have a combination of values based on the day of the week. Is it a day, uh, a weekday game versus a weekend game? And separately, who's the opponent? And they would have, you know, you know, gold, you know, silver, you know, bronze pricing or different color pricing. Uh, but uh, dynamic pricing was one step better. That said, let's to the, to the let's keep dynamic. Let's not just set it based on what we think it's going to be because, you know, the reality is you might think that the, you know, the Yankees will be good this season. In fact, if they suck by July, you're not going to sell those tickets. And so dynamic pricing allows you to adjust for that as well. Other questions? I was interested with their idea of the, the broadcast with, um, with no fans in the stadium and the potential of adding a, a new millennial type voice to kind of talk about maybe things that aren't happening in the field of play, but you know, what the players are wearing, what they're doing. I was kind of wondering your perspective on, you know, the, the potential viewers that that could bring, the younger fans, and then also how you weigh that with traditionalists of the game that may not want to see that on their broadcast. Well, the idea, that when I proposed it to Tony Clark, you know, the, you know it wasn't an original idea, but I, you'd have a, sec, a, sec, a second feed. In fact, even now, uh, during the postseason, uh, on ESPN, you can, there is a second feed. I, it, it, if you follow college football, uh, doing the national championship, uh, there was a second feed. You had you know, coaches sitting in the living room commenting on what's happening. And so that's how you would address it. The, the traditionalists can listen to a couple of old guys talking about, you know, Pee Wee Reese back in 1953. Uh, and for people who don't really care, uh, but care more about, you know, what this guy do last night at the club, because I saw him out there, you know, it's a whole different conversation. Um, our interview... I can't see all of the hands, but an interview familiar with the with the uh, uh, company called Overtime Sports. I see a few hands. Um, you know, I'm doing some consulting for them now, uh, and if you're not familiar with Overtime Sports, it is a I would call it a sports media company 
they don't have any live content, uh, but they sh highlight, uh, and it's primarily focused on high school sports, primarily basketball, but they do also highlight uh, 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 high school football, uh, boys and girls, high school basketball, uh, as well as soccer and, and, and eSports. Uh, but the if you were to go to their social media platform, platform they, don't, they don't really have a website, it features all kinds of either user-generated content, they don't have stringers at games capturing content from some, some of the more you know, interesting, if not more talented, high school basketball players, and they also have their own curated shows. Uh, typically, a ten-minute, uh, you know, you know, ten, ten episodes each session, about ten minutes long, with Quibi's trying to address with their model. And and uh, uh, over time, right now, uh, well, one name that you might recognize if you follow college basketball, Zion Williamson was was, was a kid that they followed when he was a sophomore in high school, uh, and because of their following, you know, people talk about his you know, social media followers, what he got to do, most of it was generated through overtime. Uh, there's a cadre of, of, of young kids, even younger than you all are, that really get into the personality side of these players. Um, and I mentioned it in the context of, of what you were saying, is that they're, you know, it, you know, the Gen Zers of the world care a lot more about the players and what they wear you know, the cultural aspects of their lives, then, you know, they don't disrespect or don't not care about their game. Their, their athletic talent is what drives the initial interest, but they are just as interested in, in, in other aspects of their lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, as an example of just how powerful and how interested that particular sector is, over time sports, they have roughly 32 million followers. Think about that, 32 million followers across eight different social media platforms. They're the largest sports platform on TikTok. You know, they've got multiple plat channels on, on, on Instagram, uh, Facebook. Uh, they've got Twitter accounts. It's a huge following. And, and, it, uh, and, it is, and that was part of, when I sent my note to Tony, that was part of what drove the, the, you know, my, my push to, to, to make him aware of that. Most people over the age 25 have never heard of it over time. But the point is, if you want to reach a new audience, a, a younger audience, there is a proven um, uh, uh, example of just how interested uh, younger uh, uh, fans are in the person and not just uh, the uniform. I think the, you know, you've probably heard before, but kids today, kids in my definition, under 25, uh, you know, kids, you know, folks in my generation, we, we, we root for laundry, we root for uniforms, those kids root for people. When LeBron goes from Cleveland to Miami to Cleveland to, to L.A., his fandom just keeps going up. You know, the, the Cleveland fans will follow him to L.A. That is, uh, you know, part of the thought behind, you know, if you follow, if you, if you have this secondary channel that's focusing on the, the person, the personality, that can be something that can be very, very interesting to a younger generation. Um, do you see... A growing like want for media outlets like Overtime Sports that focus more on the athlete, even like just before college. Um, I, I find it intriguing, like watching a sports documentary. Um, and it follows like the player out of high school, and you just see him absolutely like run like 100 yards, like no one's even coming close to him. So I like I find enjoyment that's kind of cool to watch. But yeah, you've seen like a growing need in those kind of uh, platforms. Sure. You know the you know the the media landscape you know continues to shift. Uh, uh, you know tr the traditional platforms have a vested interest in you know if you think about ESPN as kind of the preeminent sports platform, um, uh, they are designed to appeal to people like me and Jim. Uh, we kind of grew up you know following that particular format. Uh, they continue to try to change their format. Uh, but not only are they vested in us in terms of what we want to see, but we're writing checks every month uh, to support that. It's kind of hard to, to say to ESPN, just, you know, start focusing on the 23-year-olds and guys like us, like, well, in that case, I'm going to basically, you know, cut the, 
what I don't need to anymore. So that's there's there's going to be a a a a, a, a shift that'll that's going to take some time. Just given the economics of the embedded uh, platforms, but uh, there's no doubt as again as as platforms like Overtime. There, there are others too out there, but as, as they're proving that young people today don't want to spend you know two and a half to three hours watching one event. Uh, and especially one event that's fixated on one, sh you know, camera angle or just a handful of camera angles versus I want to be inside the game. I want to, you know, what, you know, you know, what this, you know, even if you think about the NBA, and for those who follow it, you know, over the last several seasons during the postseason, one of the highlights was, you know, what's LeBron wearing, you know, walking through the tunnel to the to the to the to the to the, to the uh, locker room. You know the, the the cultural the fashion aspects of what these guys wear become very important, and that's all. Those are all things that I think over time will become even more prominent in terms of how you know the media really, uh, you know, uh, uh, and how the leagues really present their their their, their athletes. Thank you. I'm sure we have uh, numerous more questions. We were speaking about the whole baseball situation, based on what your slide was. Uh, talking about before in terms of, you know, why they had an agreement on the 26th and why all of a sudden now um, is, it, is there a problem? Um, I told them I was a victim, and I don't mind saying it, of the 94 strike, and that's how I got yep. into ed education, and we said that people would never come back and uh, people would come back. I think it would uh, be a lot longer this time, um, but I'm sure that uh, uh, we have other questions about that and also about your career as well. Sure. Don't be shy. This is a classroom. Speak up. Hi, Mr. Mariner. This is Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, sir, for being with us tonight. Um, my question is regarding, so over the last couple of years, we've seen some changes come to baseball with the rules. You can now challenge a play. Um, they're speeding up uh, mound visits or the amount of time a pitcher has between throwing a pitch, they're trying to speed up the game. Given your time working for the league and your knowledge of baseball in general, do you see any future changes coming to the game? And where do you think it will be in, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years? Do you think we'll still have umpires? Do you think they'll be taken from the game? What are your What are your thoughts and opinions on that? I think that's a great question. And I, I you know, the changes that you've seen have, um, you know, fairly slowly. I can, you know, I started with MLB in 2002. And I, you know, sat in on, you know, pretty much, you know, most of the important conversations about should there even be instrument play at all. Um, and, uh, you know, you look back today and think, well, why wouldn't you do it? But it was, you know, uh, tradition was a big factor. Uh, uh, one of the factors that's still at play is, you know, and the NFL wrestles with this as well. You know, once you have instant replay, You've now you've interrupted the play itself. It kind of slows down in baseball. They call it the pace of the game, not necessarily the length of the game, the pace. If if you are if you have an interest in following baseball, if you go to a game, and if the game is if it's a one nothing game, uh, but it's a fast pace, you know the guy, you know no pitching changes. It's a, it's a shutout perhaps, uh, maybe a no hitter. It'd be pretty interesting to watch. You know, that, you know. It doesn't have to be 14 to 12 for it to be an exciting game. Uh, and in fact, if it's if the score is 14 to 12, it could be a four-hour game, just given the number of pitching changes, et cetera. So there's this balance between action and, and the pace itself. But all of those changes were designed to, on the one hand, address the pace of the game. You know, the, the mound visit limitations was, was designed to address the pace of the game, limit the number of times the game stops, the people don't get bored, the commercial breaks. On the, on the flip side, there's also this interest in getting the call right. Uh, and, you know, with the proliferation of instant, of, 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 of multiple screens in the home, with the, you know, high definition, being able to actually see more clearly whether the ball was fair or foul, whether the ball was, was, uh, was caught or not, you know, versus being trapped. You know, that tech, you know, with more cameras to, to, to actually catch the action, you know, you've got now more cameras in the, uh, in the game as opposed to before you only had maybe three or four cameras, now you've got multiple cameras, especially in the postseason. There was this separate push to get the call right. The NFL was the first to really go into instant replay, uh, and once you're down that path, you can't turn back. So to your question about what other changes will there be, 
you know, again, no, this wasn't an original prediction, but, you know, four or five years ago, I kept saying I, there will be a digital strike zone. Uh, it has to happen. And the only reason I said that was as I sat in those meetings, you know, 15 years ago, as we debated whether there ought to be instant replay. And just for uh, uh, historical reference, when instant replay, replay first started in baseball, it was only for what we called border calls. It was only to either determine whether the ball was fair or, or foul. You know, was, did it hit, was it inside, outside the foul pole? In some ballparks, you know, with a fencing, you know, maybe, you know, eight feet high and maybe there's a, you know, a, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, some type of, uh, of obstruction or some device between the, the foul line, uh, the, the, the yellow stripe and, and, and the seating itself. Uh, there was this question, well, did it clear the yellow line or not? Well, the, ori the original decision to it's a replay was simply to determine whether the ball was fair, foul, in or out, and that was it. There were no calls. There was an instant replay in terms of determining whether runner was safe or not. Um, so that was the first step. But then, uh, and I can't think of the pitcher's first name, but Galarag is his last name. This is the Detroit pitcher, for those who follow baseball, about probably 10 years ago, 8 years ago, he had a no-hitter going. And he was like two outs in the ninth inning and there's this ball hit the first base, and there's a throw to first base, and the umpire called the, the runner safe. And he was out by at least two seconds. It wasn't even close. Wasn't even close. And you had literally a perfect game that was broken up because of a horrifically bad call. That's what then pushed baseball to take the next step. Rather than just looking at fair and foul, let's now look at you know safe or out on the bases or whether the ball was trapped or not. And so... Once you, my point being, once you start going down that road of philosophically, like the NFL, let's get the call right. The fans at, at home now know. They can see with multiple angles, multiple replays, uh, they can see it. Let's make sure that you get the call right. Plus, you don't want to change an important outcome in a postseason game, or in this case, you know, what could have been a historic game. There are very, very few perfect games in baseball. And so, so my, my thought was, knowing the psychology and the, and the thinking, the next step is going to be, was it strike or was it a ball? Uh, you know, you know I, I was with the Marlins when we won the World Series in 97. And during the LCS, the League Championship Series against the Atlanta Braves, you know, we won in six games. We had beaten the Braves 12 out of 18 games that year anyway. So, you know, in our minds at least, you know, we were a better team. The Braves won the division. We were the wild card, but we had their number. And and during game during the the pivotal game that won that we won that game six, uh, when we uh, actually that was game five. We ended up beating game six in, in in Atlanta. But but Levon Hernandez was the pitcher. He had 15 strikeouts, and Eric Gregg was the catcher behind the plate, or was the the umpire behind the plate. If you ever were to watch replays. There were calls, I'm not sure you can see my hands, that were probably this far off the plate that Eric Gray called a strike. Now, LeVon was in a zone for sure. I mean, he was just, you know, he, he had total control. He was ahead of these, ha these hitters. And psychologically, some umpires were like, you know what, it's either this guy, you know, he's good enough, he, gets to, he deserves the call, which sometimes a lot of, you know, the Clemens of the world and the Maddox of the world, they'd get those calls because it was, it was close enough that he deserves it, he earned it, you know, he could make the call if it wasn't off the Plate. It, it was off plate. He would have made it <laughs> anyway. And, it, and and some would say cynically, the guy just want to go home. You know, we, we were up by, you know, multiple runs and like, let's not stretch this thing out. In any case, in that case, it didn't determine the outcome of the game. But I mentioned because these were pitches that were, you know, even we would say as Marlins fans, we won the, the series, we went to the World Series. We got a lot of good calls. <laughs> it was home. It was, we, we were playing at home. We got some home cooking. The reality is there are going to be certain games when it's not going to be that inconsequential. There are going to be some games where it does make a difference. You know, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's game seven of the World Series. There's a runner on third. You know, the, the, the home team is down, you know, by two runs. There's a runner on first, runner on third, and, 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 and you got the big bat up, and, and he takes a call strike, and it's strike three. 
uh, and you know, and you know, let's bet bases are loaded. And, and, if, and if, if the right call is made, and he knows he's got a good eye, it's, it's kind of a, a Barry Bonds, Gary Sheffield guys that know the strike zone so well. They took the pitch because it was absolutely not a strike. And the umpire called strike, and y'all go home like, wait a minute, we got robbed. That is what you don't want to have happen, and that is why uh, uh, it's already been tested. Uh, and I can't think what they call it now, but there is a uh, there's technology that that baseball. I was actually with an owner. I won't, you know, not that it's that important, but I was sitting with an owner doing a game last last season, and he told me emphatically, "We will have an automatic strike zone by the 2021 season." Um, this season, because it's been truncated, may push that back. It may not. It may still happen, but but they were emphatic. And the way it's supposed to be implemented is that the umpire, just like you, will have a device in his ear, uh, and there will be a digital call that he will hear. So the so to your question about will there not be umps? There'll need, need to be an ump if only to call safe or out, you know, and plays at the at, at the bases. Um, but the way it is being uh, designed, the umpire will be listening, and a there will be a digital call, and he will be told if it was a strike or a ball. And he will simply indicate strike or ball based on what he heard and not based on what he saw. Uh, that is supposed to happen for sure, uh, whether it's next year or delayed a year because of what's happening. But, but, but again, the, but the theme is, Get the call right. Get the call right. That's the underlying theme there. Uh, you'll still need them there in order to, you know, close play at the plate, you know, make the call. And even then, you'll go to the booth to see if you got it right or not, but someone's got to make the initial call. You can't have a machine do that. They said Eric Craig was the second worst umpire in the history of uh, baseball, or modern history anyway, and then uh, this Angel Hernandez isn't, uh, isn't too far behind and uh, yeah. not number one either. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've watched them both. I actually had a deal with Eric uh, during an NBA referee strike. Uh, <laughs> Philadelphia, big union town. Um, the umpires that lived in Philly came and picketed along with the um, uh, the NBA referees, and he was there in all his glory. You certainly could mm -hmm. hear him, um, but uh, there, there was a thing. The, the, the umpire that uh, screwed up that call uh, was Jim Joyce. They did a feature on him just the other evening. Right. On, on ESPN right. and is still affected to, by this today. Um, yeah. Was crying and 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 he he knew he he missed the call. So totally uh, blew the call. It yeah. was a terrible call. Probably, probably other than the call with the Cardinals uh, Royals in in '85 it was probably the you know the, the the worst call one of the worst calls at first base in baseball. Absolutely. Okay. Next. Um. The word sky judge keeps getting thrown around um, in, like, all sports, uh, NFL, MLB. Um, how far down the road do you, is it, do you think that is going to be something that sports are going to implement? And if so, how far down the road? When you say sky judge, you mean having someone uh, not in the building make a call or determine a call? Yeah, just um, somebody that, yeah, pretty, yeah, hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Well, one of the things that baseball did that was different when, when we went to instant replay, one of the things that we did that was different than the other leagues was that um, uh, the replay room was, is, is, it resides in Chelsea in New York City uh, as opposed to having someone in the, you know, sitting in a box you know, looking down on the field, whatever. Uh, and the reason that it was set up that way had to deal with a separate issue. And this is a kind of a behavioral, psychological issue. And that has to do with, um, you know, in the traditional sense, and this is what the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, let me give you the, the, the NFL approach by comparison was, the earlier approach was, uh, there's a disputed call, the coach, the head coach in the NFL will dispute the call, then the, the referees will go to this booth and they will look at, you know, in some cases, there's grainy, perhaps, you know, multiple different views. And they would decide in their own mind whether they made the right call or not. So they're kind of judging themselves. Uh, you know, they'll see it, you know, but no one's really telling them. 
uh, or and then I think they went to it. There's a guy sitting in a box who tells them, you know, we saw it. But but the point is the 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 the, the critical dis- decision point for these systems were: do you let the person who made the call review their call, which is what the NBA does? Uh, in the NBA, they will the the referees will go to the sideline. They'll see the monitor. And they'll review whether in they only make calls regarding you know possession and 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 the clock for the most part, but but the, the first point of decision making is do you let the people who are in the game review their own call? The next step would be if you don't have them do it, then do you have, and baseball had these, do you have a, a supervisor who makes the call? Um, the challenge with that, and this is as much a behavioral issue, is that if you are an umpire or a referee and someone else is reversing your call, it creates this, this uh, tension on the one hand, between this guy second guessing me, but it also uh, psychologically, it's you know, if you think you're going to get overturned, do you not make the call at all? You just say, I'll just let them decide it. So there's this behavioral aspect. What baseball decided to do was to, rather than having an um, you know, the eye in the sky, this 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 you know, these um, uh, supervisors make the call. Baseball decided. We're going to let the umpires judge themselves in the following way. Every, you know, the way that the umpiring crew is set up, you've got a crew chief and usually two, three or three guys that rotate, that they all work together pretty much. And the same is true with the NFL. Uh, so you're with the same group of guys and you travel from city to city. Um, what we decided to do was to have each crew will spend time in the replay room so that everyone has a chance to sit there and to be part of that process. So that in the current system for baseball, um, as crews, and the way it was set up, as crews rotate through New York for a Yankees or a Mets game that they would crew, they would then stay in New York and do a separate uh, stint in the replay room. And they would sit there and they would watch the screens. We have people, you know, staff full-time that would help them uh, you know, you know, with camera angles, et cetera. And our guys were good enough to know that they knew exactly, you know, if it's a call at first, if it's a home run, they knew exactly which clip to bring back right away, just given the circumstance. But every crew had a chance to basically review it. And so it made you more balanced in terms of how you view the process. It created a sense of fairness. And so that's how baseball solved it. You know, I don't know how other leagues – you know, the NFL, for you know, at least to, to date, did not have uh, full-time uh, uh, referees. I've, I thought I read something where they're going to move to full-time referees, and that might change the dynamic. But so that um, it, it may not be as critical for them uh, if they don't go to full-time referees. But for us, we thought it was important that these that every umpire spend time in that replay room to appreciate what's happening so that you don't feel like you're being judged unfairly because you're doing the judging yourself. You kind of appreciate just how hard it is to make those calls and, and it kind of changed your way of approaching. One other thing I'll mention, it's somewhat related. I remember I just got into baseball and Sandy Alderson was still uh, you know, running baseball ops for us. And one of the things that he really pushed to change was that traditionally, um, Again, you got a crew chief and you've got three, you know, umpires on the field during the regular season. You get, they, we go to six during the postseason, two guys down the foul lines to watch, you know, more closely the fair and foul uh, shots. Um, but um, historically, for some time, um, if there was, let's say, a, a close play at first base, uh, and the first base, the first base umpire made the call, and there, it was a disputed call. In the past, you know, in some cases, depending upon the nature of the play and the angle, the second base umpire or the home plate umpire may have had a better view. And it would be typical for a manager to come out and says, "Well, you know, to the first base umpire, we'll just ask the guy at the plate. You know, what did he see?" And for the longest time, before Sandy really pushed for this change. No one wanted to basically show up or override their partner. They didn't want to embarrass them. And that was part of the psychology of, of umpiring, you know, for some time. You know, uh, you know, if 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 they look to the first uh, to the home plate umpire, 
umpire umpire may have seen something different, but unless the first place umpire asked him, what did you see, they would never volunteer to say you blew the call. Uh, you know, if the guy really thought at first base, if his ego was such that he didn't feel offended to ask for help and to be over, overturned, he would then say, what did you see? He'd point to the guy, and the guy would come up and, okay, here's what I really saw. But unless they asked for help, they would never give help. Sandy changed that. He basically, as part of the evaluation, rated them on their willingness to actually ask for help. And he encouraged them, if you didn't see the plate, you know, if, you, if your back was turned, if you didn't have the right angle, just ask for help. And it became part of the culture that changed. So that was also kind of fed into the instant replay approach. That Good was question. a long time coming, I remember. It was that blue wall of silence that uh, they didn't want to get, uh, they didn't want to show up their partner or whatever. Other questions? Yeah. Hey, Jonathan, it's James. Thanks for being with us, by the way. I was wondering, as uh, head of the RSNs and with the increase in gambleized and legalized gambling moving forward, is there a, a plan in place to implement that into broadcast moving forward? Um, there's some, uh, um, there's several different uh, considerations that you got to factor in when you're talking about that. Uh, uh, on the one hand, and probably the most important aspect of that is uh, if you're watching a game, and let's just say there's a baseball game, even a basketball game going on, football game, uh, will first there's the state regulation that may, needs, needs to permit it, and then separately there's the league itself would have to in some way endorse this. But let's assume that those, are, those barriers have been cleared. The first question is if you're watching a game, and a guy's about to kick a field goal, or there's a you know a, a, you know it's it's a three-two pitch. Uh, you want to place a bet as to whether he'll walk or he'll get a hit or whether he'll strike out. If you want to place that bet, the first thing, the most important thing that 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 has to be addressed in that world is you know uh, is there any latency in the broadcast? Uh, you know if if you're able to place a bet. Uh, and there's even a two to three second delay, that could really affect the outcome of the stakes of people who are getting that delay. I mean, you could you could be betting on something that's already happened uh, and betting the wrong way. And so that's the first thing that is still trying to be addressed from a technological point of view. Can you really set up um, a system that allows for instantaneous uh, you know, betting? The second thing is the amount of information that bettors will get. Uh, baseball is taking the approach that they're going to only they're going to provide with certain betting houses, uh, uh, and I just blanked out on who they teamed up with. It's one of the, uh, oh gosh, I just blanked out. But they cut a deal with one of the betting uh, 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 establishments uh, where they gave they said we will give you our data on an on a, on a instant basis. So you get actual data feeds coming out of our system so that when bettors are placing bets, they're placing bets based on legitimate information. You can go to some back alley place and place a bet doing a live game, but their data feed may not be either accurate or timely, and it'll basically, it could cost you money. And if they know it, it will probably definitely cost you money. If you know you're betting on old information. So, those are, so that's a separate factor. The third thing, is uh, are you and, and I had a conversation about this with someone at our at, at, at Fox Sports uh, just yesterday. Um, at what level are you participating in financially? You know, if you go to Caesar's Palace and place a bet, you know that's and I'm not a better, so you know bear with me here. But that's called the handle. You know, the amount of money that crosses over to be bet is the handle. You put down ten dollars. If it's two to one odds, you know, you get $20 back. Um, you know, there's, there's a fee, you know, there may be some a big, you know, basically you, a handling fee for some of that. But, but the question is, uh, A, will sporting teams, leagues, allow for betting in venue as opposed to having to go to, you know, a, a casino or racetrack where they might allow betting in the state? Uh, most sports teams and leagues have, from what, today at least, have said they will not allow betting on site. They will not have gaming windows next to the nacho stand. Uh, so if that's the case, 
then you're not getting a piece of the handle. As a, you know, if you were doing that, you know, if you're taking bets, you you can perhaps take a piece of the handle, which is a separate revenue stream, and and you get you, know, you since you get that whether the bet is won or lost, and that's really where the money is made by the by the betting houses. Um, the more likely place where there will be uh, financial opportunities for leagues and for especially for media companies is really on the advertising. It's it's the gaming houses placing ads. Um, uh, to send you to Caesar's Palace or whatever place you can place to bet. That's really where the economics will be for the most part for sports teams and, and for leagues. It's simply generating more sponsors that want to drive you to their betting sites more so than getting a piece of the handle itself. Once you've separately solved the issue of do you have a reliable, credible, you know, integrity filled process to make sure that that they're that 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 every better is, is making a a fair bet. Um, the uh, uh, I had one other point that I was going to make about that. Uh, uh, it just slipped my mind, but but that's but fundamentally that's that's where the economics really come into play. Uh, you know, can you generate additional eyeballs? In fact, that was the last point I was going to make. The the other. For baseball especially, but I think for every sport, and some would say this is already the case for the NFL in a number of different ways, when people have a stake in the outcome of an event, they're more likely to, to want to watch it. Um, the reason that, you know, some would say, and I'd be in that camp, the reason that the NFL is as popular as it is on Sundays is not because people care about, you know, whether the Cleveland Browns won or not or it's, they care about whether their player in their pool, in their fantasy pool or whatever game they're playing, scored enough points to have them win something. They don't care as much about the sporting outcome as much as they've got a stake in watching. And so, uh, and I've got a lot of friends, especially young friends, who are in uh, different uh, fantasy leagues. And, 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 in fact, you know, ESPN has a separate broadcast just on choosing fantasy players. That's what drives the eyeballs to these games. It's, I need to see how my player did as opposed to did my team win. So there's this notion that with gaming coming to other sports, including football, but especially sports like, like baseball, that that might actually, on the media side, to your earlier question, would drive more eyeballs. People want to watch more because I've got to bet. Uh, I'm trying to win uh, more so than I care about whether this guy got a hit or not, whether his average went up or down. So. I could have sworn they were doing something in Allegiant Stadium with the Raiders having betting there. No, uh, they may. I haven't. I'm not. Yeah, you know, I'm not a better, so I haven't followed it me that either. closely. It would not surprise me. Okay. In, in Vegas, yeah. Uh, in Vegas, yeah. It's it's legalized. And accepted in the stadium, you know, I'd be surprised if they didn't have, you know, uh, windows. I could betting. be wrong, John. Yeah, it wouldn't. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if, if in Las Vegas they had it, but I doubt it's in any other place. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, when you think about it, for what it costs to go to an NFL game, would you spend that kind of money to stand in a window placing bets, <laughs> uh, as opposed to watching the game? You know, so I I I don't know that it that being there physically placing a bet will be uh, more desirable uh, than uh, just sitting at home and, 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 you know, if to the last question, you know, if you could, in watching the TV on an interactive basis, start placing bets on your screen, you know, you'd rather do that in your living room where the beer is cheaper and the chairs are softer. Uh, but to my earlier point, you need to make sure that you're betting on a game that hasn't already ended or the, the event that had already happened. It's kind of like you know, Oh, sorry. I was going to say, if 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 you're recording a game, so, you know, the, ultimately you're recording a game, you're betting on a game that's, that's ten minutes old. You know, good luck <laughs> winning. <laughs> so, go ahead. Thanks, sir. Thanks for uh, for joining us tonight. I just have a quick question. I've always wondered about uh, leagues and their different TV deals. Um, why do some leagues have better TV deals than others? Is it really based on popularity or length of season, or, or how does that work? 
uh, it's all of the above. The reason that the NFL gets as much as they do is because they drive more eyeballs. Uh, the way the rights deals work is very, very straightforward. There's, there's two categories of rights deals for the most part. There are the cable guys that basically will buy rights from teams, will sell the content to cable operators like Comcast or DirecTV, uh, and DirecTV and Comcast, who have subscribers, will use those subscriber fees to to pay the content owner. You know, if 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 Fox buys the rights to uh, uh, to the Yankees to Yes Network, uh, uh, you know, Fox has to write the check write a check to the Yankees. Fox gets their money because Comcast will pay them for the content that they just purchased from the Yankees. Comcast gets their money because you and I write them a check every month for our subscriber fees. And so that's what drives. So the more subscribers you have, uh, the more you can afford to, to pay for those rights if, there's, if, if, if the rights are scarce. You know, in some markets, they're, you know, where there aren't any subscribers or, the, or people aren't as interested, it's, it's different economics. But that's one model. The, the other model, the ad model, is the network model that Fox and CBS and NBC uh, and ESPN on, 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 on Monday nights, they pay for those rights, again, based on eyeballs. They know that if I write the NFL a check for X billion of dollars, I've got to generate Y amount of advertising. And the reason that they get so much is because this is kind of a built-in advantage. The NFL owns Sunday. The beauty of NFL owning Sunday uh, is, you know, in the, in the winter, in the fall and the winter, is because there's no college football. There's no, there's no very little baseball. There's no very little basketball, especially at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, they don't even have – the other three sports all play in the evening. Now, the NFL has slowly moved to a Sunday night game, a Monday night game, even a Thursday night game just to, you know, just make more money. But for the most part, they establish their platform based on literally competing in a window – where there was zero competition as opposed to, I remember my first, I was, when I was with the Marlins, we had to cut our first TV deal. This is back in, in, in the early 90s. And cable wasn't as, as predominant. You know, the cable household penetration was probably, you know, maybe in the 50%. Today it's, you know, in the 90s. Uh, but back then, broadcast TV was where most of the sports content was. And, but it was changing, uh, and we were negotiating our deal. We had to negotiate with, you know, at the time, the local. This is the Marlins local TV. You know, we talked to, you know, AB, the local ABC, NBC, CBS affiliates, and they all said to us, "And eh, we like our primetime programming on Monday through Friday nights, so we can sell more ads if, you know, uh, uh, you know the Cosby Show, which is hot back then, or Married, which, you know, whatever the hot show was, so we can sell more ads for that show than if we had baseball content. We will not preempt our 8 o'clock window for baseball. Um, the NFL, on the other hand, has no competition uh, in the evenings uh, uh, on a weeknight. They only play on Sundays, and so that's what really drove the value of that content. You know, people get home from church. They got nothing else to do. They turn on football, uh, and there's only – limit number of viewer windows. It's only, you know, you know, 16 games uh, for the season. So that scarcity was a separate factor. Interestingly enough, baseball has the second highest, you know, people might say that basketball is a more popular sport in terms of demographics and some other places, but baseball has a better TV deal because they simply have more content or as they say in the broadcast, business, more tonnage. There's a lot more, the games are longer, there's more games, a lot more ads to sell, and therefore you get more money for that. It's that, it's that simple. John, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking some time out this evening. I know you're very busy and keeping busy with Fox Sports and overtime and everything else. Uh, um, I want to uh, express our, our thanks again and uh, give a nice round of applause uh, to you. Thank you. And, and for the record, the Fox assignment, that was a temporary assignment. I was only doing that until uh, Disney sold the RSNs to Sinclair. So that assignment is over now. So okay. I had seen I'm it on the resume. I wasn't sure whether yeah. it was over or not. Yeah.
So, but thank you so much, uh, Jim, and, and to all of you uh, for uh, uh, giving me your time and attention to, to do this. I always enjoy talking to your classroom. So thanks so much. All right. And uh, next summer, you'll be back live with us. I hope so, for all everyone's <laughs> sake. Absolutely. You all take care. Good thank night. you again, John.